You want your bass low and loud? That's easy. You just need a big enclosure. In this video, we're going to talk about Dr. Joseph Anton Hoffman and how you can use his iron law to get the most bass from your system. A lot of you have probably heard of Hoffman's Iron Law. In this video, I'm going to tell you some stuff that you didn't know about Dr. Hoffman and how his law works. Back in the 1950s, Dr. Hoffman postulated that when it comes to designing a speaker enclosure, there were three factors that were intertwined. Low frequency extension, efficiency, and enclosure size. Extension refers to a woofer's ability to reach down and hit those low notes. Efficiency refers to how loud a speaker can play with a given amount of power. And enclosure size is just the size of the box. That's Kind of simple. To paraphrase Dr. Hoffman, your speaker enclosure can either be low, it can be loud, or it can be little. Pick two. Just to be clear, we're not talking about the size of the woofer or the cone area of the woofer. Cone area will have a huge impact on performance. Hoffman's Iron Law only pertains to the enclosure. Now, a lot of people will tell you they've got a pair of 10s that will hit harder than a pair of 12s. That's just nonsense. 12s are gonna have more cone area than 10s, so 12s in general are gonna play louder and lower, and in general just outperform 10s. Now, this particular set of 10s might be able to handle more power and have more X-Max and therefore outperform some other 12, but the 12 inch version of this one will outperform the 10 inch version of this one. And that has nothing to do with Hoffman's Iron Law because Hoffman's Iron Law, once again, is about the enclosure. Hoffman's Iron Law is summarized in this efficiency formula right here. Now, a lot of times when I show a formula on the screen, I get people jumping into the comments asking, why do we have to have so much math to understand this stuff? I'll explain that to you in just a little bit. Now, this efficiency formula isn't one that Hoffman himself came up with. This one came from either Thiele or Small of the Thiele small parameters, or are they feel small parameters? I'm really not sure how it's pronounced, but it's based on Hoffman's concept. And what you can see in the formula that none of the feel small parameters of the subwoofer are listed in the formula. The formula just shows the relationship between the sensitivity of the enclosure, the F3 of the enclosure, and the volume of the enclosure, or the size of the enclosure. And if you want lower base, you're gonna get less efficiency, and the way you compensate for that is to make the enclosure bigger. Again, this formula just describes the characteristics of the enclosure. Your actual result will differ depending on the subwoofer that you put in the enclosure. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that a ported subwoofer enclosure is gonna play louder than a sealed subwoofer enclosure. Can we use that to get around Hoffman's Iron Law? Well, take a look at this efficiency formula again, and right here in the formula, there's this K, that's a constant, and that constant changes depending on whether you're using a sealed, a ported, or my personal favorite, the old passive radiator enclosure. The lesson of Hoffman's Iron Law is that if you want your subwoofer to be low and loud, you need to put that particular subwoofer in a large enclosure. Uh, my buddy Nick did that with his latest home theater build. I'll let him explain that to you. When I did the MX-15 build, I wanted something big and bad. I mean, I wanted that deep, deep bass. I mean, this was for my home theater, so I wanted to make sure it shook the room, and boy, does it shake the room. But in order to do that, it had to be a really big box. In fact, this type of box had to be 5.3 cubic feet. And by doing that, I could tune it down to 21 hertz completely flat and allow it to have an F3 of 20 hertz. And when I say that this thing shakes, it shakes. I mean, the whole house shakes. It's funny, I had some friends over and they thought that I literally hid bass shakers underneath my seats, but it wasn't. It was just that one 15 inch sub. And I gotta say, I love that low bass because that bass is bass that you feel, not here. And that is quite an experience. Man. I sure do love that Hoffman guy. And I'll give you some links to his video down in the description. Another factor that's outside of Hoffman's Iron Law is the environment that the subwoofer is in. If you put a subwoofer in a car, for example, you're gonna get a significant boost from cabin gain. And that's really fortunate because that's gonna give you the ability to put the subwoofer in a slightly smaller box. Now, why should we actually care at all about this Hoffman character and his Iron Law? Well, I think it might help a little bit to get to know Hoffman himself. Hoffman was a music lover and an audiophile from an early age. His father was a world-renowned and world-famous concert pianist. 
I actually found a digitally remastered recording of his father's work on Amazon, but it's not currently available. So Hoffman grew up in a house surrounded by music. Hoffman ended up at Harvard studying engineering, and while he was in college, Hoffman was recruited by the US Army to work on the Manhattan Project. Hoffman was one of a handful of people who were there to witness the Trinity event, which was the first detonation of a nuclear bomb. His job at the test site was to take measurements of this containment vessel called Jumbo. The original plan was to put the bomb in Jumbo, that way if it were a dud they could contain the plutonium. They ended up not doing that, and they put Jumbo on the ground 800 feet away. Jumbo survived the explosion, and Hoffman's job was to measure the pressure and the deflection of this giant sealed container. A giant sealed container? Under pressure? <laughs> Sound like something we do in car audio? After that, Hoffman went back to Harvard where he got a PhD in physics. So by his mid-twenties, this guy's earned a PhD from freaking Harvard and he's witnessed a nuclear explosion. How many people on the face of the earth have done that? But Dr. Hoffman was just getting started. From there, he decided he should be an entrepreneur and he became either a founder or a partner in three groundbreaking audio companies. Uh, one of them was KLH. The H in KLH stands for Hoffman. The other two were Advent and Acoustic Research. Research. These companies, they were the giants back in their heyday, y'all. When Hoffman was working for Acoustic Research, Acoustic Research controlled 32% of the hi-fi speaker market. Not only that, while he was working for Acoustic Research, Acoustic Research patented the very first sealed enclosure. The patent holder was the founder of Acoustic Research, Edgar Vilcher. Here's something you didn't know, the sealed loudspeaker was patented after the vented loudspeaker. A researcher at Bell Labs back in the 1930s held the patent for the vented loudspeaker, and Vilcher patented the sealed enclosure in 1956. If it were not for Joseph Anton Hoffman, we would not have the field of acoustics as we know it today, and the hi-fi market as we know it today wouldn't exist. And without that, back in the 50s and the 60s, we never would have gotten the car audio market that we know of today. You've heard of TS parameters? Well, Thiel and Small based their work on Hoffman's work, so we wouldn't even have TS parameters if it weren't for Hoffman. And that's not even the thing that 99% of you don't know. There's, <laughs> there's so much more this guy did. In a lot of my videos, I explain the mathematics behind all this, and oftentimes in the comments, people ask, why does this have to be like rocket science? That's because people like Hoffman could have been a rocket scientist. He was definitely smart enough to do it. And he solved problems that we think of today as trivial. Well, because he solved them back in the 50s, man. <laughs> this guy was pretty legit. I'm a bit of a fan. What an amazing guy with an amazing life. Uh, and here's another thing that 99% of people don't seem to know, and that's how to spell his name. It's spelled with one F and two N's. I actually had a very hard time researching this because all the car audio forums spell his name wrong. Now that we know a little bit more about the man himself, let's talk about some of the practical implications of Hoffman's Iron Law. The first thing that you have to understand is this is physics, it's not magic. Like I said before, you can't make a 10 sound like a 12. A PA subwoofer with a lightweight cone and a small magnet just isn't gonna behave like a car audio subwoofer with a big, thick, heavy cone and a giant magnet. These are different beasts. One of them is more efficient than the other. Back in the early days of car audio, we actually used big PA speakers as our subwoofer. Subwoofers. They had the cone area we needed to make the base. Over the last 40 years ago, these two types of drivers have become specialized and have morphed into their own separate things. The car audio subwoofer got heavier. It got a big magnet. It got giant voice coils. It got these high roll surrounds and these very stiff spiders. So they morphed into something with a heavy cone and a heavy suspension and a powerful motor. When that happened, the driver became less efficient. A PA driver in general is more efficient than a car audio subwoofer. And while all that was happening, car audio amplifier power got less expensive. Now we have these inexpensive Class D amplifiers, so we have plenty of power to throw at these inefficient subwoofers. And that's how we've worked our way around Hoffman's Iron Law. And you have to remember that when Hoffman was working on this problem, he didn't have the ability to throw power at the subwoofer. He didn't even have what we would call a subwoofer. The actual drivers he was working with, we would consider quite primitive, and he didn't have access to a Class D amplifier. So when he was working for acoustic research, trying to figure out how to get audiophile quality sound, how to get that low bass and hit those low notes with authority, his solution was to make the box bigger. Now we're still limited to the amount of power we can throw at a subwoofer and we're limited by the stock electrical system on your car. That's where the bottleneck is. 
That cheap Class D amplifier is not really cheap after you spend $1,000 on alternators, batteries, and wired. Now, I'm not a big fan of upgrading my electrical system, but if you really want to get around Hoffman's Iron Law, you've just got to start throwing the power at the subwoofer. And my buddy here, Andy, for example, he's upgraded his electrical system. Let's see what he has to say about upgrading the electrical system. Got our uh, stock alternator here. And... Boom! Look at that. Now we have a high output alternator, a 320 amp alternator, 220 amp idle, and you're going to have a lot more power going to your batteries and your amplifier, and you're just going to have a better day. Now for people like me that don't want to go through all the extra expense of upgrading the electrical system, you have to follow Hoffman's Iron Law. That's why when I design a subwoofer enclosure, I typically design it a little bit bigger than the manufacturer recommends. That's because Dr. Hoffman's smarter than I am, and he's probably smarter than you are too. Now there is a limit to how large you can make a subwoofer enclosure. And to understand that limit, you have to understand that the air inside the enclosure acts as part of the subwoofer's suspension. And as the enclosure gets larger, that air suspension gets weaker. If the box is too large, the suspension on the driver can no longer control the cone movement and you're gonna get distortion. I like to model that in WinISD. If you wanna see how I model, design, and build subwoofer enclosures, check out these playlists right over here. And before I go, I want to say thank you to my patrons. Hey, thanks guys for helping out with this video, especially $25 patron Dylan. And thank you so much to Toys DIY Audio and Living Lab with Andy for helping me out with this video. Make sure you check out their channels. I'll give you some links to it down in the description.